Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our final Anthenaeum Symposium series. I am Monica Parrish Trent. I am one of the instructional deans here at the Germantown campus, and I'm super excited to welcome poet Victoria Chang, who's going to share some of her work with us and tell us a little bit about her ideas and her philosophy behind her poetry. Before we begin with Professor Chang, I would like to remind everyone that we are recording this session, and at the end, there'll be Q&A with both of the microphones on the side. Professor Sharon Anthony will lead us through that. I'd like to especially welcome all of our students and Professor Anthony's students who are here from her Women in Lit class, from her English Women in Lit class, so thank you for coming, students. Sharon Anthony is currently a professor of English at Montgomery College in Germantown, Maryland, where she's worked for 13 years. During this time, she has been the English 101 coordinator. She's the co-chair of the General Education Committee, as well as the Women's Studies coordinator for the Germantown campus. She has taught courses including English composition, literature, mythology, and general studies. She served as a faculty advisor to various student clubs and considers herself fortunate to work with so many wonderful students at Montgomery College, as well as her colleagues in the English department and her faculty colleagues throughout the college. She's been recognized with the Outstanding Faculty Service Award, the Germantown Excellence in Teaching Award, and the Women's Studies Program On Her Shoulders We Stand Award. Sharon is a passionate, enthusiastic teacher. Her classes are among the first to fill up. Many, many of our students have gone through Professor Anthony's English 102 course in particular and done really, really well as transfer students. So um, as a fellow English faculty member, we're really proud of the work that Sharon does. Um, Exactly. <laughs> uh, Sharon is very proud of her work as a professor, but she's also especially proud as a mom of her two sons and her German Shepherd and her husband. So please welcome Professor Sharon Anthony. Good morning, everybody. Sorry, I'm not as tall, I'm not as, tall as Monica. Um, today we're very fortunate to have Victoria Chang, an award-winning poet, come and speak to us and share her thoughts and her, a little bit about her work, and I'm very happy to have her. I thought I'd spend a few moments telling you just a little bit about Victoria Chang. Uh, she was born in West Bloomfield near Detroit, Michigan in 1970, and like some students here at the college, her parents were from Taiwan. Uh, she graduated from the University of Michigan. Uh, she went on to also earn degrees from the prestigious Harvard University and the Stanford Business School. She also has an MFA in poetry from the Warren Wilson College, which is noted for developing our nation's very influential writers today. And she now lives in California. I'm sure it's an early morning for her. <laughs> um, and she works in the business industry, specializing in marketing and communication. And she teaches poetry at Chapman University. Again, like many of you, she balances her business career with her love of writing, taking it to a very successful professional level. Her first published book of poetry was Circle in 2005, which won the Crab Orchard series in poetry and the Association of Asian American Book Award. Her next book of poetry, <clears throat> excuse me, entitled Salvinia Molesta, was, pu was published in 2008. And she chose an interesting title for this book because it is named for what has been called the worst weed in the world. So invasive and dangerous, in fact, that it can smother an entire lake in a matter of a couple of days. And it's so invasive that it's illegal to sell or possess it in the United States. But Ms. Chang develops this weed metaphor to represent consuming evil in many forms, such as corporate greed, office jealousy, infidelity, desire, and economic, ecological, and even historical atrocities, such as the massacre of Chinese people in Nanking by Japanese troops in World War II, and the excesses of the Cultural Revolution in China. Ms. Chang has also published a myriad of poems in literary journals, such as the Paris Review, Virginia Quarterly Review, Slate, Plowshares, and The Nation. In 2004, she edited the anthology entitled Asian American Poetry, The Next Generation. And this was the very first anthology dedicated to profiling a new generation of Asian American poets. And it included some known and established Asian American poets, but also expanded the literary spotlight to include young Asian American poets, the up and comers. What a wonderful, what's wonderful about this book and Ms. Chang's role in it is that it explored Asian American national identity and underscores the challenges that each generation of Asian Americans uniquely face. These young voices are rich and varied and present a very fresh, strong musical voice for our nation. She also writes children's books, such as the book published last year entitled Is Mommy? 
Her third book of poetry was published in 2013 and was titled The Boss. Um, it won a Penn Center USA Literary Award and a California Book Award. The Boss has been described by critics as having a new and unique rhythm in which we can recognize ourselves as we wade through the waters of work responsibilities, family relationships, personal hopes and dreams, and the powerful and sometimes overwhelming expectations of others. Specifically, Ms. Chang's writing speaks to the pressure of what it costs us to excel by conforming our multifaceted selves to the narrow expectations of our bosses and to the organizations within which we work, study, and live. I would like to read just a couple of passages from the boss to represent some of the themes that I personally can identify with and I thought really were very moving. Um, she addresses what this sort of drive to succeed costs us personally. She writes, we are high performers, make papers smell like perfume. We are highly creative, unusually industrious, exceptionally conscientious, diligent, intelligent. We are high performers, former high hopers, on a high wire, balancing a ream of paper on our heads. Doesn't this sound like many of our lives right here at the end of the semester? Um, she starkly points out, though, that sometimes all of this hard work doesn't matter a whole lot when tragedy hits. For example, when the 9-11 tragedy hit. And she writes in one of her poems, when the plane is hijacked, when the man in 13E says to put their hands on their heads, Jack in 14D will suddenly forget that he is one of hundreds and there is only one hijacker even as he falls and his face is pressed on the plane's plane carpet. She talks about how often we have to step over others to pursue success with that capital S. She writes, the boss has a band of people around her, the way a band bends around her finger. The boss's husband calls her a Rottweiler. One day at the park, I watched a Rottweiler chase a ball, chase after me. I ran, the, rat the Rottweiler ran, I jumped into the water, the Rottweiler swam, its mouth open, 42 rotting teeth, tongue out. Importantly, Ms. Chang also reveals how we pass on this pressure to succeed at all costs to our family, our children, our next generations. She writes, today my daughter wants to be a waitress when she grows up. She doesn't know that a waitress is not a boss, that a waitress takes orders from everyone, that a waitress must run to a bell, to the phone, to the customer, to the supervisor, who is super boss. Yesterday, my daughter wanted to be a pet doctor. The Barbie book has fuzzy pets, furry pets, cute pets. Barbie doesn't show her missing finger from the cute pet that bit it off. The Barbie is not the boss. The dog is the boss. Ken is the boss. <laughs> In another piece, she points out that sometimes rigid goals rob us of our ability to dream. She writes, my daughter stands at the window. Her tears can still open her face like a zipper. She knows exactly what she wants. She wants to play with the 11-year-old who no longer has time to play with her, who is busy on her path to becoming a boss. As you can see, her work is profound and can reflect our own experiences as we grow on this journey. Now, it is really my honor to introduce Ms. Victoria Chang to tell us a little bit about herself, her work, and her thoughts today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for coming. Thank you um, to Professor Anthony for that amazingly well thought out and um, prepared, as we were talking about a second ago, uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. And thank you so much for Dean Trent um, and for Montgomery College and um, Joan Nake, Professor Joan Nake, 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 got it. Okay. Um, Okay, so I wanted to first um, basically say, tell you sort of what I'm, what I'm gonna do. Um, I'm gonna read from three of my books of poems and I'll start with the newest book. Um, and then I'll mix in sort of in between some of the older poems that I've written from the other two books. And then I'll kind of circle back um, to the boss and um, and then we'll we'll kind of play by ear. I, I might do something fun with you and have you do some some a little bit of writing on your own, um, even though there's it's a bigger set. I think we'll we'll just do that for fun and we'll see how it goes. Um, and then we'll do some Q and A at the end. And I think that should work out well. And we'll we'll see how it goes. And very organic, so we'll kind of play it by ear. Um, so let me give you a brief like two two minute intro uh, to this book. Not even two minute, maybe one minute. Um, so I wrote this book, The Boss, 
while I was sitting in a car waiting for a child, one of my children, to finish a language class. And they, I basically had two hours. And so instead of driving back, I just thought I'd sit. And um, I started writing these long lined, no punctuation, a lot of wordplay sort of things that uh, weren't actually poems. And at the time, um, my father had had just a stroke, and so he suffers and suffer, suffered and suffers from aphasia, which is just basically dementia. Um, and my mom has this disease, this terminal disease, pulmonary fibrosis, which is when your lungs basically um, dry up and you can't have any oxygen go through them, and she's since passed. Um, and then my uh, two kids, a bunch of them were, both of them were actually were under the age of five. And then I had this really um, challenging boss. And so all of these things felt like they were swirling in my head. And I just started writing these long thing, these long lines. And I really wanted the wordplay to, uh, to propel the poems forward. And I wanted them to sort of mimic that loss of control that I was feeling. Um, so I'll read the first one from this. I think this was literally the first one that I had written. And they have no punctuation, a lot of wordplay, so they're, they're a little challenging to read. I once was a child. I once was a child, am a child, am someone's child, not my mother's, not my father's. The boss gave us special treatment, treatment for something special, a lollipop or a sticker, glitter from the toy box. The better we did, the better the plastic prize made in China. One year, everyone got a spinning top. One year, everyone got a tap on their shoulders. One year, everyone was fired, everyone fired but me. One year, we all lost our words. One year, my father lost his words to a stroke, a stroke of bad luck stuck his words, used to be so worldly. His words fired him, let him go without notice. Can they do that? Can she do that? Yes, she can. In this land, she can. Once we sang songs around a piano, this land is your land, this land is my land. In this land, someone always owns the land. In this land, someone who owns the land, owns the buildings on the land, owns the people in the buildings, unless an earthquake sucks the land in like a long noodle. Oh, you don't have to clap, it's fine. <laughs> thank, but thank you. Um, so I'll read, actually I'll read another poem which um, Professor Anthony had, had read. And it, um, it's, you know, we all, probably many of us work, right? I assume, and we, um, or we, if we don't work in sort of an environment, we'll eventually probably work in an environment where we have these things called performance evaluations. So. Um, I included some of the text in here from my own, one of my many performance evaluations. So this is called, We Are High Performers. We are high performers, not normal, but high performers. We perform things, make papers smell like perfume. We are highly creative, unusually industrious, exceptionally conscientious, diligent, intelligent. We are high performers, former high hopers on a high wire, balancing a ream of paper on our heads. No net under us, just the boss with her arms crossed in a knot, glasses fogged. We think she is smiling. Yes, the boss is definitely smiling. She has finally found a vein on her wrist that smells of oil. We plug away despite the plagues in other countries. We are still in awe of the boss and the law and all the dollars. The doll I once had is now my daughter's doll. She will dream of balls and gowns and sparkly towns. When should I tell her all the towns are falling down? Um, so this one, um, is, uh, and if anyone knows anyone who has aphasia or um, dementia, it's really a frustrating disease that you, know, you see this person wants to get something out, but they can't, and it's kind of stuck stuck there. And so, um, but some of the, the mal problems actually are pretty funny. Um, the most recent, my dad called these handles. And so it's very interesting that it's so close sometimes, yet so far. And so this one is about my father. Um, it's called My Father Says. And none of these actually have titles. They're just literally the first one or two or three words of, of the, the poems. My father says, 
My father says the wrong things. I say the wrong things. My father thinks he is 42, not 69. My father was born in 1942. My father thinks his address is 1942. My father sits in a hospital. He thinks the year is 1942, that I am 1942 years old, that his knee is 1942. He thinks his name is 1942. He says he is in the hospital because of weight, or maybe he means weight or lean. Maybe he means he leaned on the toilet he was fixing and fell down. He doesn't know where his nose is, but he knows 1942. When I was 19, I wanted to be a doctor. In a few years, I'll be 42, and I'll be afraid of doctors. I can no longer think of the right words to say. My words come out of my mouth, twisted, turned in, spirals like a dancer wrapping her leg around a pole. On some days, the boss takes our 1942 and turns it into 2491. On other days, she turns it into 1429. And on the worst day, she smiles at us, and her smile looks like a nine turned on its side with a cat's tongue sticking out. When asked to close his eyes, my father points to the wh white stack of papers. When asked if his name is Adam, he points to the papers as if to say, ask the papers, don't ask me. He no longer knows that a Chinese man from Taiwan can't possibly be named Adam or Bill or Bob or John or Gus. Maybe now he thinks a Chinese man from Taiwan can be a CEO, can be a boss in America. Maybe now he thinks his name is Adam. Maybe that is why he named me Victoria. So then I wrote a bunch of these, and then I ended up with about um, 20 pages and like a normal composition notebook. And eventually I ran out of material, you know? I think I just kind of hit a wall. Um, what I think is really common in any, any form of sort of creative arts, um, especially if you feel like you're working towards some sort of thematic thing, which I was, and and then I, I just looked on my bookshelf and, and um, there this, Edward Hopper, this painting, which I don't know if you, you all know, but um, he hasn't written a lot. It's almost a cliche, actually, to write about a poem about Edward Hopper's paintings, but I noticed that a bunch of them were actually, um, they had taken, they took place in office settings, and so I started just kind of riffing off of that and playing with that, and um, so this one's called Edward Hopper's Office at Night, and um, if you don't know this painting, um, this is one where there's a guy sitting at a desk with, a, I think, a green lamp, and then there's a woman standing. Um, she has, like, really large breasts, and she's standing. She's wearing a blue dress standing next to a filing cabinet. But the reason why I think these, these paintings are so fun to write off of, they're called ekphrastic poems, is so that um, they, there's just they're so mysterious, right? And so um, this one's Edward Hopper's office at night. The boss is sitting at the desk. The boss doesn't look at her. The boss is waiting for the black telephone to ring. She also waits for a ring from the boss. He is waiting for the files from her, her blue dress like a reused file folder around her body, her hands tight around the files. The filing cabinet might eat her, might take her hand off. The boss might eat her. The boss wants her, but the boss wants money more, just a little bit more. The boss always seems to want the money a bit more. The boss doesn't hear there are taxis outside waiting for all the women down on the street. Across the street, a boss prepares for bed. Another boss above him in apartment X rotates a Q-tip in his ear before sex, despite instructions on the box. We took my father out of the paper, the living will, the letters with their little capes, will leave the paper. Who will take care of my children later? Who will take care of my father? The will will take care of no one. A piece of paper cannot take care of anyone. I cannot take care of everyone. On some nights, I wake in a panic and can't tell if I'm dead or alive. This year, I dye my hair so I won't have to die. Um, and then eventually, I ran out of those paintings as well. And so, um, so then I started going back to them and repeating um, repeating using the same painting and then kind of riffing off of it from a different perspective, finding a different sort of entry point. And so um, this is uh, the last one I'll read from here for now, and then I'll switch over to maybe some of the older, a few older poems. But it's also called Edward Hopper's Office at Night. Maybe the woman in the blue dress is the boss. 
Maybe the man leaning over the paper is not the boss. Maybe the man is filling out an application for employment. Maybe the woman, for her enjoyment, came into the office to check on the man to make sure he is still working before she leaves for the night, before she leaves to meet her boss for drinks. Maybe the woman is checking on his work, footing his numbers. His one foot barely shows under the table. The other hides in a shadow. When things go wrong, whose fault is it? Everyone wants to know who started the fights in the office. Some nights, I hear my two-year-old fighting with someone in her crib. She is bossing someone around. No, 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 bad, that's mine. You don't take mine. I wonder if she will be a future boss in the office with a green carpet with the blood red stains, bossing around the man who can't get his numbers to foot. On other nights, I hear her singing, happy birthday to me, happy birthday to me. She is already celebrating herself. She will be the perfect boss. Um, so I'll read just a few poems from the um, the first book, and then a few from few poems from the second book, and then I'll end here. I like to give you a map so you sort of know what to expect. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, I was um, writing. I like to write in other people's voices sometimes because I I think it's it sort of breaks open the creative process, and so um, I was in a library and couldn't really find or think of anything to write about, but I was feeling that itch, that sort of creative itch to do something. And so um, I found this book on the shelf and it was seven, this one page just said seven reasons for divorce. And um, it was during the Shang Dynasty, which was a long, long time ago, obviously, um, 1765 to 1123 BC. And these are all obviously reasons that men could divorce women because it couldn't go the other way around at that time. And so I just thought I'd write a poem on this for fun and have the seven reasons for divorce in all these different voices of, of these women. Seven reasons for divorce. One, disobedience to in-laws. I'm the girl who wakes within an ocean making winter melon soup for my mother-in-law whose taste buds rise like thorns. Two, jealousy. Your new maid returns to your room again. I am in the kitchen chopping pork into a guillotine of Red River. The stew smells like your boiling heart. Three, disease. I am thinning, unable to hold even a hairpin up. My body pocked. My face in the mirror has a hole in it. Why won't it grow back? Four, adultery. He built a hurricane for me. You had the same chance, idiot. How you missed my heart in its throbbing coat, I will never know. Five, stealing. Yes, I ate them. The red bean, a roiling surf on my tongue turned to mud only because you found out. Six, barrenness. Something is thundering in my body. You can hear it in the soil, bulbs breaking out into a cathedral. Seven, talking too much. I still mean what I did not say. So um, when I first started writing, I wrote a lot of sort of bad relationship poems. And um, Professor Anthony and I were talking about how when you first start writing, you, you write a lot from your personal experiences. And, and um, in college, I had a lot of bad relationships. So a lot of my poems ended up later becoming uh, and in my 20s, too, about kind of these sort of things. So here's just one, it's a short poem, and this is a kind of a recurring image of this man in the white truck that kind of spreads throughout this, this book. So this one's called Man in the White Truck. Each night, your newly learned tricks, an infinite pit of don't call, don't write, call, don't write, don't call, just write. Each dusk, I splurge, fill empty flasks, spend money I don't have, eat donuts I don't need. I'm stalling on a stool at a coffee shop, having what the next table thinks is boring shrimp and cocktail talk with you. Or perhaps I am in your truck, cutting air, an underbelly of an aluminum can. How orange the earth is there, so extraordinarily fire. And I wonder why I am not on your list of the 10 most stolen, welding my dress into a prison. Some say you have no heart, but it is beating you to death.
Um, I'll read one more poem from this book. And I, and I hadn't noticed this before, too, that um, I had written a bunch of ekphrastic poems in this first book as well until I looked back recently. And, um, it's, and I actually found the same painting. <laughs> um, Edward Hopper's study, Office at Night, it's exactly the same one, but it was from, from a long time ago. And it's just written without that kind of rhythm and, and, and beat and the music that I was writing in, in for this particular project. This one's called Edward Hopper Study, Office at Night. She wishes the man at the desk were a flambéed banana that she might nibble, one hand lodged in the filing cabinet, the other waits to enter, settling against the open drawer. She glances down at the carpet, the color of an unripe mango. As for the man, he likes how the light mimics the mood of a hospital corridor. He's afraid to look at her, to consider the field between her breasts. He thinks of green ledgers with red lines, commas, numbers lit by the banker lamp's gaseous glow. But he returns to the number eight. Its curves make him think of her bareness, how her body might stiffen in fever just for a moment before she falls on him, the way wash rag spreads in a basin. How's everyone doing? So quiet and so serious now. <laughs> no, that doesn't mean to clap, but <laughs> I know my poems are very serious. If you know me personally, you know that's not the case, but it's interesting how I think um, art is a way for us to, I guess, channel different parts of our alter egos. So for me, poetry is a way to kind of explore some of the th obsessions I have and some of the darker things that I think about. Um, so my mom was a math teacher, and she taught math in Detroit, Michigan, in inner city high school. And um, so there are always math books everywhere. And even though I didn't particularly enjoy math, it was always a part of our lives. And um, so I thought I'd write a poem called Proof. It's not really mathematical, but it's as close as I think I could get to that. Proof. And I should give you a little background, too. My grandmother, um, I guess her... She left China during the war and ended up in Taiwan, and then her sister ended up staying in China. And so these two sisters, I guess, ended up having, you know, obviously really, really different lives. Um, and this whole family exists in China that we don't really know. But I've seen some pictures exchanged here and there, and and um, was told that you know they they lived a really tough life after after her, uh, the sister left to go to Taiwan. And um, so this poem kind of thinks about those things. It's called Proof. They say my great uncle read foreign books in a mud house in Nanking, plowed his 20 acres, listened to rare birds, disregarded the willow's hush. One day he knelt in the street, sign around his neck that said, traitor. Little red books spread like wax on his back. Even birds spun their heads around. He labored with peasants, hands turned rough. He must have had eyes like golden orbs. One day he disappeared. I'm standing in the dirt in La Jolla, perpendicular to the earth, weeds exploding, rows and rows of berries, clouds that reach and sever. He is hanging from a mud house in Nanking, perpendicular to the earth. Our angles are equal, therefore we are parallel. Then there must be two birds, two shores, two deaths. And this last one I'll read from this book is also exploring kind of those issues. It's called Two Trains. And there's just a, a short epigraph that says, Taiwan and China are 100 miles apart. Two Trains. A train leaves Nanking traveling at 60 miles an hour. Another leaves Guangzhou traveling at 40 miles an hour. Question. Which train will be farther from Nanking when the trains meet in the middle of a field? Does it matter that the sister on the faster train is pulling seven children, half lost, half mad? That they spend 40 nights in the train following the trophies of a dying army? Or that the woman left my great aunt in Nanking, half turned face with her kingdom of furniture? Answer. When the trains meet, they will be the same distance from anywhere, but one will be empty, and I'll never know how many fingers circled throats how a mind empties out within a cinching rope, why she picked the dark lake with its silver polish, with its deranged rain. Each night a train doesn't stop, it just blows its horn, and we listen and twine our cold blue feet. 
Um, okay, so I will read um, two more poems from the boss, and then we will do maybe something, a little tiny bit of writing, and then I'll do a Q&A. So... Um, actually, yeah, this one, Professor Anthony read a portion from, but it's called Today My Daughter. I tried to write poems with no children that appeared in them, but they just creep into everything, all parts of your life. Um, so this one's called Today My Daughter. Today my daughter wants to be a waitress when she grows up. She doesn't know that a waitress is not a boss, that a waitress takes orders from everyone, that a waitress must run to a bell, to the phone, to the customer, to the supervisor who is super bossy and wears a greasy visor. Yesterday my daughter wanted to be a pet doctor. The Barbie book, the Barbie book uh, has fuzzy pets, furry pets, cute pets with small noses. Barbie doesn't show her missing finger from the cute pet that bit it off. The Barbie is not the boss, the dog is the boss. Ken is the boss of the dog, who likes the dog in a pink outfit, who likes Barbie in little skirts with little hips. If a perfect woman like Barbie is not the boss, then who can ever be the boss? Even the man in HR, the man who can fire everyone, cannot be the boss, because he has a boss who hired him, who can fire him. And even the man who hired the HR man has a boss who can fire him. There are fires all over Japan right now. The fire and water both want to be the boss. All the bosses in Japan lost their jobs, lost their limbs. Bob and water no longer care about Bob, the boss in America, no longer care about cost. So I'll write, I mean, I'll read one more. So these were actually um, uh, really fun to write because um, of the wordplay, and so it was a fun it was a fun exercise for me to try something new, and um, and a bunch of these poems are very personal, and then I ended up feeling sort of uncomfortable with that. So it's you can see sort of how some of these poems kind of wind and, and wend their way around and, and end up at sort of these larger global things that were happening or have happened, and so there's a bunch of 9/11 poems, and so I'll end with um, this one 9/11 poem. And, um, and then we'll have you guys pull your little pens and pencils out. The boss calls us at home. The boss calls us at home. The boss can call us anytime. The boss tells us to turn on the television, not to go into work. I watch over and over the planes, the buildings that met each other, wept each other, the people stuck. The boss's voice shakes the boss. Sorry, I'll explain. Um, other the people stuck. The boss's voice shakes. The boss must look familiar, like a mother, like a sister. But the boss isn't our mother, isn't our sister. The shoe doesn't fit. She can whimper, does whimper, can feel sorry for other people, can vomit sadness. When someone says, it's personal, when is it not personal? About the person. When the planes crashed into the towers, the pilots' bodies met a CEO, their bodies pressed together, their power latched together on the 54th floor hating each other, embracing each other like an accordion. Thanks. Um, so I always think it's kind of fun. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I don't like to read for too long because I think uh, I tend to be sort of a visual learner. So um, listening for long periods of time, I, I tend to lose uh, focus. And so I thought it'd be fun with um, you to to kind of do your own little thing. And I know some of you probably write poetry, some of you don't, some of you have no experience. I know most of you are probably here because of extra credit. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about metaphor and um, similes. And what I love to do in my poems is, is to use, think about the image, and which is essentially, um, I think of it as a picture in words. And I love thinking about different ways of um, writing things that seem familiar and then connecting them in terms of similes and metaphors. And so I'm sure most of you know what similes and metaphors are, but I'll just give you a two second kind of, it's not really an intro, it's just kind of what I've scribbled. Um, there's a French philosopher named Paul Ricoeur who calls metaphor a mind put in a state of war. So I love this definition. Um, but more traditionally, a metaphor is a word or phrase that is used to make a comparison between two things. So um, oftentimes in poetry, not two things that are not usually put together. 
And uh, a simile is um, just that, that same kind of comparison, but using the word like. So I'll give you an example. So using Shakespeare, um, he said, this is a, um, a metaphor. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? So that's a metaphor. And then this really wonderful Swedish poet named Tomas Tranströmer, who has since passed away, had said that a newspaper is like a dirty butterfly. And so that's a simile, right? You can see someone, well, I don't know if anyone reads newspapers anymore, but when they used to read newspapers, you'd open them and they look like a dirty butterfly in, in his wonderfully uh, creative mind. And so what I would love for everyone to do is to grab a pen or a pencil or a computer or whatever, and we're just going to have fun just sort of writing these own, our own kind of beginnings. I like to call them beginnings of poems. And um, to, so I'm going to give you maybe about seven things, and you just write quickly or slowly, however, you know, everybody kind of works differently, and I work very slowly, but, you know, some people kind of want to kind of think of the first thing that comes into their mind, um, and I'm just going to read you seven things, and you're going to fill in the blank, and then, so, you know, the idea is to kind of, you know, you can be silly, or you can be artistic, you can be very deep or philosophical, whatever, whatever comes to your mind, and trying to make those really large leaps so that you kind of mimic that idea of, you know, your mind in a state of war. So these really large leaps, and the more unusual, I think, the more interesting. So is everyone ready? Yeah? Okay. So the, um, the first one, we'll just, we'll just start with the newspaper and see what you come up with. So the newspaper is like a blank. I'm not going to give you that much time either, so. <laughs> Number two. A spider on an old man's beard is like. Three, ice cubes in your glass of wine are. Four, the coffin was so beautiful, it was like. hard, right? Five. The driftwood on the beach looked like. Six. The ice plants glistened blank. This is the last one. And if you didn't finish them, that's fine. You could do them later if you feel like it. The cars down on the street look like. And so the idea is that, you know, all of our minds, I think, can do that mental leaping. And so essentially, if you've even written one, you know, no matter how bad you think it is, you've essentially written a poem. And then to take that sort of image or metaphor or simile and kind of blow that out to um, like a longer poem. But essentially, the, I think of these little nuggets as the beginning kind of connective tissue of what starts out as being kind of a deeper philosophical 
thinking about kind of what you're thinking about right now, what you're going, you know, what's happening in your life, you know, what kind of turmoil is happening. And if you want to, you can take one of those snippets and go home and just write a whole poem based on, on those. Thank you. Um, so should we do Q and A or, okay. Yeah. I worked, I went into pre-K in a local school program, which is Bar T, I'm sure someone in here works there or has heard of it. Didn't really like that. So I moved on, became a soldier, did that, was told what to do. Didn't like that, moved on. So I've been out now since September and I think now that I look around at society and the world and everything, I find it rather strange that having to cut my hair is something I need to care about and or having to dress nice or just having to listen to the boss or this authority figure that I don't view as an authority and I don't I don't view I don't mean that in a harmful way I'm not angry I don't I don't seek anything malicious but the the boss poem I I don't want to feel that way and that's that's now what I, what I'm looking for with my life is mm -hmm. what's next right right well it's interesting that you say that and thank you for sharing your story because I think um, a lot of what inspired that whole book was this idea of the slippage of hierarchy so um, it's just exactly what you're describing I mean in one hour you know you could be the boss of your children right and then in another second you're spouse or your partner, your boyfriend, girlfriend, whoever is the boss of you. In another year, you could be the boss of your new partner. Um, and then you're, you're boss of people at work. And then you have boss, a boss, or actually many bosses usually. Um, and so it's like this constant daily slippage of in and out of being in control and out of control, which I think is actually just a part of life, you know? And I think that, that it's important to find a career path that you know yourself, like I'm not much for authority either, truthfully, and so I think you need to find that path where you have the least sort of resistance in that regard, and um, that might be like starting your own company, you know, like where you can just start off right away as like the boss kind of thing, or being a professor, because a professor has a lot of authority just sort of granted to you, um, because you control so much in terms of the, the grades are at the end, it's the carrot, and so all semester, you know, you just feel this, sense of um, you know, authority. And I think that it's, if you look for careers that you know fit your personality, I think um, that's sort of what I would tell you. And it's kind of, I think, what I've ultimately ended up doing with my own life. But you know, it's part of life. You switch in and out, and you, you try different things. And as, I think as you go along, that's, you start picking up. Like, like you use other things and situations to ping off of yourself to basically just be a mirror. And eventually you figure out, okay, this is who I am. I know what I like or don't like, so I'm gonna find things that fit that. Word, good for you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> I was wondering how you balance um, writing about your personal life and your personal situations and having people you know and maybe have written about read your work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I've been, kind of lucky in that this, well, this, this boss, um, I had quit already and it had taken like, <laughs> thankfully, right? Um, I had taken like two years for me to actually finally write about that traumatic experience of having this horrible boss. I've had so many good ones so that this one's just really traumatized me. Um, and then my dad has dementia, so he has no idea what I write about. Um, and then my, um, my mom passed away and that was very liberating because then I, I always that's the one I feel the most guilty about you know so um, since then I've written like a middle grade novel that that uh, is all about um, hair pulling trichotillomania this disease that my sister grew up with and unfortunately still suffers from and so it's um, since my mom passed away I felt like I finally could kind of write about some of those things and so I haven't had the I, I haven't had to do that, but I know a lot of my friends who write memoir, it's a big problem. And, um, you know, I think that something what they do is they turn in, like, their manuscript to their family sometimes. They look through this, or um, Dave Eggers, who's a writer, um, 
he, one of his ex-girlfriends, there are some sex scenes in there, and so he basically showed her the manuscript before a uh, heartbreaking work of Staggering Genius, which is his memoir um, that came out. He showed that to her long before it actually went out. So I think that's how sort of other people deal with it, but I just deal with it by not, um, <laughs> which is the only way I know how. So. <laughs> Well, you kind of just answered my question there. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. and, uh, but um, kind of, I guess, just touch on it again. But dealing with so much turmoil um, in your life, how do you um, stay positive and not actually uh, give in to the, I guess, stress? Yeah, actually, I've been thinking about this lately. I've been thinking that I, um, my poems are so negative, right? And um, they end negatively. And so I've been trying to be more positive. And um, someone said to me, you know, how do you flip that. And I think a lot of people of color, um, gender, women, I think you experience so much sort of micro aggressions or micro, they're not even aggressions, but all day long for your whole life, it gets kind of tiring. And I think after a whole lifetime of that, you end up with sort of almost like a kind of a negative personality. <laughs> and so it's, it's important to try and I think flip that, which is what one woman just asked me, how do you flip that? And I just love how she said that. And I, I don't have the answer to that, truthfully, because I haven't figured it out. But I do try and um, think of that this is my life and I'm not a victim. And so I try and keep thinking to myself, I'm not a victim. You know, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is actually really fulfilling life to live. And if I name certain things, you know, if I name racism or if I name, you know, sexism, or if I name sort of these things that happen to me, it doesn't make me a victim. And so that's important for me to remember myself. Um, but yeah, it is something I do think about and I have lately been thinking about a lot too. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. Hi. So much, thank you so much for coming. Um, earlier in my uh, life, in, in, mainly when I was in college, I dealt with poetry more mm -hmm. than I do now because I was into, I was in music and so I sang art songs and so poetry was really personal and special to me, but I've kind of gotten away from it, so it's nice to hear your poems and, and you challenged us. I actually, I wrote a little bit here, seven lines, could I read it? Could Absolutely. I, read it? I was going to ask if you wanted to share, but it's such a large group, but I didn't okay. want to bother you guys. Um, <laughs> the title is, I Am Not a Poet. I'm not a poet, I don't know poetic rules. I only know poets are truth tellers, but truth tellers don't need schools. Truth tellers need vision, only clear vision to see all those things around us that we all take every day for granted as the truth. They show us through chosen words that the truth is hidden, is obscured by a curtain of accepted reality. But when they show us the truth, we recognize it was there all the time. Thank, Thank you. you. What, oh, what advice or what would you recommend to someone who might want to write a poetry book or publish one? Yeah, um, I just always tell people to read as much um, contemporary poetry as you can and see what's kind of happening and to, and whenever you read a book, look on the spine and see who did it and then look in their acknowledgement pages, see where they published their poems. And um, so that's sort of the, that's sort of kind of like your end goal. And then while you're learning how to write, I would just say to read as much as you can, everything, um, every poetry book, uh, anthology, old poetry, anything that you can get your hands on, find the stuff that really speaks to you. Um, and then just kind of practice by, by, you know, just engulfing all of that sort of poet's skills and then just get better and then just take a bunch of classes and be around a community of writers because I think being a writer is so hard. It's probably, my husband who's an, um, uh, an engineer always kind of looks at me and says, why do writers do what they do to themselves? Because it's, probably one of the hardest um, fields that you can go into because the rejection level is so high um, that it's important to have a community of writers and friends around you. So um, just go to a lot of writers' conferences and there's a lot of fellowships for stuff like that. So apply and go away for the summer for like a week and be surrounded by writers and, and, and build your network of friends and things like that. And eventually it kind of comes together, you know? It takes a while and you don't realize it's coming together, but it does, but that's kind of what, what I did and I would recommend that to you as well. What made you really, what made you really get into wordplay? Like you're so good at it, how did you get started? 
Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, I think I had read a book of poems, this great book of poems by Shane McRae, this poet, um, and, uh, and it just, it didn't have a ton of wordplay, but there was something rhythmically and sonic about it, and so I just started doing it for fun, and then um, I just found my other poems, the lines, to be kind of flat, and I found them to be a little bit dull, even when I was reading them aloud, and so I, I just wanted to play, and I think it's a part of... Um, the experimentation of being any, any sort of artist, you know, writer, painter, musician, whatever, you just like, you get tired of your own voice. So I think I wanted to try something new. Um, and then I just kept on doing it and it was just so much fun. And now I, I'm trying not to do it as much anymore, but it's really hard to shake um, because I think it's really, it's enjoyable. And it's, it, it helps, actually it helps with the, the um, you know, that's the moments when you get stuck because you, you rely on the words to say, oh, okay, that's, so that'll play, and so now I just go in that direction. I go where the poems and the words sort of take me. So it's a good way of sort of, I guess, cheating for me as in terms of writing. Well, it's enjoyable to listen to. So oh, thank like you. It. Thanks. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any children? Yeah. Okay. Um, children, you said? Yeah. Yeah, so there's a nine, I have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old, two girls. Yeah. Okay. I have a 21, 14, my mm -hmm. son should turn 14 a day. <laughs> Um, and a 10-year-old, but my 14-year-old, he wants to do acting, producing, and things like that. And I think that knowing about poetry and writing more and doing a lot more reading than what he does now would help him. And I'm just looking to see if, because you are you know, a writer and you do so many things, what would you say for me to lead him into that direction so that he'll be knowledgeable of how he can excel when he goes into he's going into high school uh -huh. and I'm trying to get him into a boarding school. So how can he be able to work on himself when I'm not there or when he goes off to college? Right, right. Well, I'm, I'm sure you've thought of this, but you know, I just would expose him to as many plays as you can um, because a lot of the plays are based on books. And you know, um, what, whether it's Shakespeare or not, right, um, even um, you know, young adult plays or children's plays. I mean, there are a lot of them are based on on like very popular books by children, and I, I guess that's sort of the what I that's I think I've done that too. Like we go to these plays all the time, and then it's like, oh, you know, it's based on this book by you know so and so, and um, and I so I think I would just bring him or encourage him to go to as many plays as possible and make that connection between um, acting and the written word, and and also movies too are always based on scripts. And so there's always something that needs to be written down before one can even act. And so I think that's sort of the connection that I would make. Um, and then just surround him with books, just buy them and, or borrow them and just stack them around. And, and, um, and then also, you know, I think by reading yourself too, you know, uh, always having books around, they see sort of you always reading. And I think eventually they kind of model that behavior after you too. So that's kind of what I do with my own kids. I don't know if it'll work with your son, but I think it's a great, um, it's a great thing to get involved with plays and things. And I think that sort of, you'll be surrounded by people who are very literary and like to read and, and things like that too. Yeah, I think that's excellent advice because my son, um, I had got him an audition at another school and he went online. I said, you got to learn a script, so right. find a script. And he went online, looked up the script, mm -hmm. and studied it, mm -hmm. and watched the movie, and, right. wa and read. And he was so into it. And in my house, the rule is when you get home from school, get something to eat, and go straight to the library to do your homework, mm -hmm. read a book, you got to stay there for at least an hour. <laughs> you know. So I encouraged them to do that. So uh, it was just good to know that you basically is saying, you're confirming my theory on how to go about getting it done. I was just trying to get confirmation right. that it was the right way, plus with the added on that you did. Yeah, and I think too that when you read books, I mean, books are they're characters, and you know, they, it makes you think about things that you normally wouldn't think about. I think just reading in general makes you a deeper person, which will make him a deeper person, which I think will make him better able to embody the characters that he's trying to embody, because you know, I think it's hard to be a good actor if you're kind of on the shallow level, but if you're really a deep person and you've really thought about all of those deep human emotions that we all feel, which is oftentimes done through reading, um, I think that, I, I really think that that's gonna make him a better actor in the end. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, um, I was wondering, um, 
the last line of your poem, I don't remember the title, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. It's okay. Um, you talked about, um, you said something like, I dyed my hair so I wouldn't die. Uh -huh. And normally, I didn't want to ask the question. I just wanted to know what you meant by it. Because mm -hmm. in poetry, it's kind of like a personal, it's your personal understanding. But right. I really wanted to know what you meant when you wrote that down. Uh -huh. um, well, you know, the joke amongst poets is every poem is, is about death, right? So, um, And so I think that's what I was sort of alluding to um, when I wrote that, which came out very quickly because I was playing with the words, um, and it ended up becoming about mortality. So, you know, there's this idea of as you age, your hair, some people younger than older, but for me, you know, it, it had started sort of getting gray, and I still don't really dye my hair, but it's, start, I mean, there are grays, and so that the sign of grades, grays coming in is the sign of aging, mm -hmm. which is just sort of one foot closer to death. And so that's kind of what I think I was thinking about at the end of that poem. Okay, thank you. What, what did you think? Well, I Not wasn't sure. sure. It was like yeah. around that idea, mm -hmm. but I just, you know, I thought maybe be, I don't know. More complex. No, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. Uh, I just want to thank Ms. Tankler one more time for coming and speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you. And he'll be out there performing after we're done here. So thank you very much for coming and have a nice day.